I'm so glad to welcome Dr. Kara Long from the Gynecologic Oncology Service. We're so glad to have you back at Memorial and glad to have you on the panel today. Welcome. So good morning. Um, I'm even a little nervous after Dr. Offutt's talk about duty to warn. Um, I'm going to be discussing risk-reducing surgical options for women at genetic risk for gynecologic cancers. Uh, just a very brief sort of mention of where we are with ovarian cancer in 2015. Uh, we still don't have an effective screening test. The majority of disease still presents at an advanced stage, and therefore focusing on prevention really is key. And the way to do that is to identify women at increased risk who can benefit from risk-reducing strategies. And uh, we believe that the best way to do that is to uh, offer genetic assessment to all women with high-grade serous ovarian cancer. I do want to talk a little bit about where we've been and what the gold standard is before I move on to sort of the, the lesser known options. Risk-reducing salpingo-oophorectomy is the most effective risk-reducing strategy for women at increased risk of ovarian cancer. Uh, this does require a surgeon experienced in risk-reducing procedures, so it can be, for, be performed in a safe, minimally invasive approach. Additionally, a pathologist experienced in evaluating uh, prophylactic specimens is also crucial for the success of this procedure. We utilize the CFIM protocol, which is sectioning and extensively examining the fibrillated end of the tube to identify uh, malignancies and or precursor lesions like sticks. This is where the distal two centimeters of the tube is transected, serially sectioned, and examined. So just to discuss a little bit about risk-reducing salpingu phorectomy and BRCA mutation carriers, we do know that this is an effective operation, resulting in a 75% decrease in the risk of getting a new breast or uh, GYN cancer, specifically about an 80 to 90% decreased risk of ovarian cancer, and approximately 50% decreased risk of breast cancer. There have been many studies, uh, many from this institution, uh, which were prospective, retrospective, or combined, showing a significant benefit in ovarian cancer risk reduction, as well as many showing a benefit in breast cancer risk reduction. However, as many know, there are serious implications of removing a woman's ovaries prior to the onset of natural menopause. Surgical menopause has health implications, such as increased risk of cardiovascular disease, bone health, lipid levels, and overall mortality. Additionally, quality of life is impacted with hot flashes, vaginal dryness, dyspareunia, sexual function, and changes in body images. So whereas we know this is an effective operation, it can also come with serious consequences. So what are our general recommendations? As the age of onset of cancer is different among BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation carriers, our recommendations for the timing of risk-reducing surgery is different. BRCA1 mutation carriers have an approximately 11 to 21 percent risk of ovarian cancer by age 50, and therefore we recommend considering risk-reducing surgery at around age 35, and if the patient chooses to confer, defer, we recommend this be done by age 40. In BRCA2 mutation carriers, where the risk of developing a cancer by age 50 is lower, we recommend consideration of RSO at age 40 with completion by 45 to 50 in patients choosing to defer. I'm not going to go over this too much because Dr. Robson uh, just presented this so nicely, but in patients with moderate penetrance genes, the data on impact of risk-reducing surgery is not yet available. Family history and clinical genetics consultation should be strongly considered. And there are mutations such as BRIP1, RAD51C, RAD51D, and possibly RAD51B, which have been shown to be associated with increased ovarian cancer. Most of these uh, cases presented at a later age, and therefore the risks and benefits should be discussed with patients between age 45 and 50. Other moderate penetrance genes uh, do not have enough evidence, and therefore we do not recommend routine risk-reducing salpingophorectomy based on the mutation only. So what about the role of hysterectomy? The role of hysterectomy is clear in patients with Lynch syndrome who have a risk of endometrial cancer reaching up to 61% by age 70. This risk is approximately 2 to 4 percent by age 40 and increasing to approximately 8 to 17 percent by age 50. Additionally, there is a risk of ovarian cancer of up to 10 percent by age 70. This is uh, the second most common cause of inherited ovarian cancer. Risks do depend on the mismatch repair mutation identified. However, these patients are generally diagnosed at a younger age than people with sporadic cancers. So we recommend risk-reducing hysterectomy and BSO when childbearing is complete in the early to mid-40s. 
Uh, this was briefly mentioned by Dr. Offit, but there has been recent data which suggests that women with BRCA1 mutations may be at increased risk of uterine cancers, and that those uterine cancers are the more aggressive high-risk types. Dr. Koff presented data at SGO in 2014, a prospective cohort study, showing an increased rate of these high-risk uterine cancers uh, in patients with BRCA1 mutations. However, this is new data, and all the available data is limited and inconsistent. Therefore, we do believe that more research is needed before we can routinely recommend hysterectomy for women with BRCA1 mutations. As in any clinical encounter, the patient's other uh, gynecologic uh, history must be considered, other uterine pathology and surgical risks before this uh, can be uh, performed. And at this time, there's insufficient evidence to recommend routine prophylactic hysterectomy for BRCA mutation carriers. So moving on to some of the newer areas, what is the fallopian tube's role? There are still many questions. What is the origin of high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma? I think many of us are coming to understand that this is the fallopian tube. Does salpingectomy decrease the risk of developing ovarian cancer? What is the role of salpingectomy in high-risk women? And what is the role in average-risk women? So uh, just to briefly cover, uh, high-grade serous ovarian cancer likely originates in the fallopian tube as molecular markers and gene expression suggest a tubal origin. There's a high rate of TP53 mutations in the tubes of BRCA-positive women, and we have identified a precursor lesion in the tube. Serous tubal intraepithelial carcinoma, or STIC lesions, are identified in about 15% of women undergoing risk-reducing BSO for BRCA mutations. And in women with high-grade serous ovarian cancer, sticks are identified up to 80% of the time when there is a BRCA mutation, and 40 to 60% of the time in high-grade serous sporadic ovarian cancer. There has been no other ovarian precursor lesion identified. So this leads us to our new hypothesis of ovarian tumor genesis. So going back to what we can do about the fallopian tubes, what do we know? Well, we know removing the ovaries and fallopian tubes is protective. We also know that bilateral tubal ligation likely has a protective effect, with many case control and cohort studies showing a decreased risk of ovarian cancer in women who have had tubal ligation. So is salpingectomy protective? Uh, one of the largest studies addressing this question was a population-based cohort study from 1973 to 2009 utilizing the nationwide healthcare registries in Sweden. They looked at over 5 million women which over 200,000 of them had previous GYN surgery. And of this cohort, there were 30,000 cases of ovarian cancer. The exposures they defined were hysterectomy, hysterectomy plus BSO, salpingectomy, and sterilization. They found that all groups that underwent these gynecologic surgeries had a lower risk of ovarian cancer, with the most profound risk in the hysterectomy plus BSO group. This data was limited, however, due to the fact that many of the women who underwent salpingectomy actually underwent unilateral salpingectomy at the time of ectopic surgery or other benign gynecologic procedures. So these, these numbers are important, but they cannot be directly extrapolated to prophylactic salpingectomy. So what is the role at this time of salpingectomy in high-risk women? Bilateral salpingectomy with delayed oophorectomy has been proposed as an option for women unwilling to undergo risk-reducing salpingo oophorectomy at the recommended age. There is no benefit for ovarian cancer prevention, and there is likely no benefit at all for breast cancer uh, pre prevention. So we recommend that this be utilized as an adjunct to screening alone in women who refuse to undergo the recommended risk-reducing salpingovrectomy. And it is important to note that in prior studies, a significant percentage of women with BRCA mutations do, uh, do defer risk-reducing salpingovrectomy or decline altogether. If bilateral salpingectomy with delayed oophorectomy is being performed, the intraoperative considerations are that the peritoneal cavity needs to be thoroughly expected, pelvic washing should be obtained, the fimbriae of the tube should be completely excised, and again, the CFIM protocol should be utilized. So what are the pros and cons of this procedure? Uh, the risk reduction uh, would come without the added morbidity of menopause. It gives clinicians an opportunity to inspect the peritoneal cavity, and it allows for pathologic evaluation of the fallopian tubes and potentially identification of precursor lesions. However, the degree of protection against ovarian cancer is unknown. There is likely no breast cancer protection. Two operations are needed, one to remove the tubes and one to later remove the ovaries. And there is a possibility that women will decline completion oophorectomy altogether. 
The cost and benefits of this approach have been uh, examined by Quan et al. in 2012 using a Markov multicolor simulation model where three approaches were evaluated, risk-reducing salpingo-oophrectomy, bilateral salpingo-oophrectomy with delayed oophrectomy, and bilateral salpingectomy. While RRSO had the lowest cost and highest life expectancy, bilateral salpingo-oophrectomy with delayed oophrectomy had the highest quality-adjusted life expectancy and was cost-effective alternative when considering quality of life. So just to uh, bring this to the role of salpingectomy in average risk women, which is um, uh, sort of a hot topic in our field, opportunistic salpingectomy has the potential benefit for a mass risk reduction in the population. This can be done during pelvic surgery for benign conditions or during permanent sterilization procedures. However, there are potential risks. Is there added operative time, added surgical risk? Is there compromised blood flow, which could lead to premature menopause? We do know that menopause occurs in 20% of women within five years of hysterectomy, which is approximately four years earlier than those without. Ovarian function has been assessed in several studies, um, which have utilized ultrasound and laboratory indicators of ovarian reserve after salpingectomy. The data is very limited and it is conflicting with some studies showing decreased ovarian function after salpingectomy and others not. There is no long-term follow-up available, and there are no patient-reported outcomes. The numbers are low. So we still have the question, if menopause does occur earlier, how much earlier, and does the benefit outweigh the burden? In terms of surgical risk, this procedure has proved to be quite safe, with retrospective and consecutive cohort studies have uh, been published in the past few years, showing that there's no difference in complications in operative time, EBL, uterine size, post-op complications, ER visits, or readmissions. And interestingly, in the study published in 2014, there was a higher rate of subsequent adnexal abnormalities in the group not undergoing salpingectomy, which required surgical reintervention in the future. So is this resulting in a change in practice? The OFCARE group from British Columbia reported the results of their population-based retrospective cohort study in 2014, which is accompanied by an educational initi initiative in their region, which was speculated to decrease the incidence of ovarian cancer by as much as 40%. This included over 43,000 women in British Columbia from 2008 to 2011, where salpingectomy was evaluated uh, in the context of hysterectomy for benign disease or sterilization. They did find that operative time was increased. However, there was no difference in length of stay, readmission, or transfusions. Most interesting to note, however, is during this three-year time period, salpingectomy with hysterectomy increased from 5% to 35%, and salpingectomy for sterilization, 0.5 to 33%. So physicians are changing the way they practice. Another cost-benefit ratio was done looking at opportunistic salpingectomy, and they found that hysterectomy plus salpingectomy was less costly and more effective than hysterectomy plus BSO. However, salpingectomy for sterilization was more costly but more effective than BTL alone. The absolute benefit of this is estimated to be a number needed to treat of 273 for hysterectomy and 366 for sterilization. And again, this is to prevent one case of ovarian cancer. Just for perspective, the number needed to treat for the HPV vaccine is 324. So this is uh, one of my favorite quotes from researching this topic. There were few facts found, but plenty of opinions. You can find more uh, editorials and opinion pieces about this than actual data. Um, so just to conclude the talk, I wanted to come back to what our, uh, our sort of um, organizations uh, that we take our guidelines and recommendations from recommend. So ACOG, in discussing um, the role of salpingectomy during benign pelvic surgery, recommends that women at population risk undergo routine pelvic surgery for benign disease, that the surgeon and patient should discuss the benefits of salpingectomy. And when counseling women on laparoscopic sterilization methods, clinicians should actually discuss salpingectomy as an effective method. They state that prophylactic salpingectomy may offer clinicians the opportunity to prevent ovarian cancer in their patients, but of course more studies are needed. The Society of Gynecologic Oncology uh, uh, published their recommendations to prevent ovarian cancer in 2015. They recommended oral contraceptive use, tubal sterilization, risk-reducing surgery, risk-reducing salpingoophrectomy in women at high risk of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, genetic counseling and testing for women with ovarian cancer and other high-risk families, and interestingly, salpingectomy after childbearing is complete at the time of elective pelvic surgeries, hysterectomy, and as an alternative to tubal ligation. Thank you.